Hello there. Welcome to another edition of Hashtag Now Smoking Classic Edition. I'm Gary Korb, your host, executive editor for SmartAdvisor.com, and today I'm going to be smoking the Rocky Patel 15th Anniversary Robusto. And guess what? I've got Rocky Patel and Nimish Desai right here with me. We're going to smoke it together. How do you like that, folks? So, Rocky, Nimish, thanks for joining me today. And um, great to be here. With you, Gary. <laughs> yes, I know it's uh, it's a very, very, very different time in our lifetime. And uh, you know what? It gives us an opportunity to spend time, solitude, and also through the internet, talking mm -hmm. about cigars, getting into detail about the fine things about the art of this luxury lifestyle product that we call premium cigars. And uh, I'm happy to join you today. All right. Well, thank you, because I, I really do appreciate it. And uh, well, fortunately, I have a nice day here today. And um, let me talk a little bit about your cigar real quick. This is the Rocky Patel 15th Anniversary Robusto. And as you know, once a month, we do a classic. I consider this a classic, and I'm going to even give more reasons why it's a classic in a minute. But this cigar is rolled in what they call the end two bar method, which means that the tobaccos are rolled individually inside each other. Correct, Rocky? And not just That's correct. So when you actually bunch a cigar before the wrapper goes on it, you take the three or four leaves that make up the filler, which is the guts of the cigar, and there's two ways you can actually bunch the cigar. Mm -hmm. one, is the, one is the method you kind of just kind of talked about, which is the tubular fashion where they take each leaf and they roll it like you would roll up a tube, right? Just kind of mm -hmm. like a, a, a round kind of rolling process. And then you put one on top of the other in a specific order so that it allows air to flow freely through those passages so you have a nice drawing cigar and a cigar that burns evenly. The other method is where they take the individual leaves and they fold it in an accordion fashion and then one on top of the other. So right. not that one's better than the other. They're quite different. They're art, mm -hmm. both art, artisan kind of, you know, uh, ways of making and bunching a cigar. But this one, so all our cigars that are made in Nicaragua are the tubular method. And the reason being that Emil Carr, who's our partner in the factory over there, was trained mm -hmm. in Cuba. And the Cubans basically do everything in a tubular fashion. Now our factory in Honduras, there everything is bunched in an accordion fashion. So you're right. This one is in a tubular fashion. Yeah. And and it, it provides a better draw and I think a little more flavor too. So the um, binder is a uh, Nicaraguan Jalapa. I believe the filler is Nicaraguan. It's a mix of Nicaraguan, I guess, from different um, regions or whatever. And then we have the um, the wrapper, which is an Ecuador Havana. Is that that's why I like that's a Habano seed from Ecuador. So you know, Ecuador has some of the finest wrappers in the world. So I really like the Habano seed, which is the seed right here. They have a Sumatra seed. Uh, they also have a Connecticut seed. And the the reason Ecuador grows so much wrapper is because most wrapper is grown under cheesecloth, under shade, right? So right. the shade actually blocks out about 75% of the ultraviolet rays. The plant gets about nine and a half, ten foot tall, as opposed to sun-grown tobacco, which is grown in the sunlight, and the plant gets about five, five and a half feet. So when you have this tobacco grown in the shade, the leaves get very, very long, very, very broad, but yet very, very thin, and they're perfect for the outside of the cigar we call wrapper. Well, in Ecuador, there's so much cloud cover that it forms a natural type of shade. So as opposed to having cheesecloth, which is typically what you put in the farms to block the sunlight, in Ecuador, because of the natural cloud cover all the time, you really get some good wrapper in the Havana seed, in the Sumatra seed, and now also they're growing in the Connecticut seed. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a well-known country. And, and speaking of Ecuador, I hate to bring this up right now because That's all right. <laughs> uh, you know what's going on with the virus right now. I just talked to uh, Nesta Placencia Jr. yesterday because oh. we were talking about whether the factories are going to stay open, whether they're going to close, yeah. what they're going to do with the government there. And he was telling me Ecuador is so bad right now. They're finding bodies in the homes. They're finding bodies in the streets. There's nobody there to pick up the bodies, either from your home, from the streets. It, it's, it's unbelievable. 
and I'm surprised we're not getting enough media coverage or any. Wow. Uh, but yeah, wow, that is really terrible. All right, so uh, let's get back to the cigar. Now, here's what I found out about the cigar. And this is why it's a classic. In 2011, the torpedo in this line placed number six in the top 25 and got a 93. In 2013, this very cigar here, the um, Robusto, uh, placed number 18 in the top 25, got a 93 also. In 2018, the Toro, in the Tubo version, hit number 20 in the top 25, got a 92. So that's three out of four sizes in this line that have all had 90 plus scores and have all in the top 25. And I think that's a real tribute to to what you guys have been doing down there and in this particular cigar. And I can't wait to light it up. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say it's really, really beautifully done as always. It's box pressed. I love box pressed cigars. And uh, Rocky, you do a lot of box press stuff. Yeah, I love box press cigars. You know, box pressing the cigar is truly a unique art. I mean, there's the drones do it, a few other companies make box press cigars. And mm. I love them because you get a richer, concentrated flavor profile and the cigar still burns cool. And I believe the reason for that is that when you take a round cigar and you box press it, there's mm -hmm. less air between the tobacco. And when there's less right. air, like a cardboard into the car, the cigar is burning slower. It doesn't burn as hot. Yet you get a nice richer flavor when you actually puff on the cigar. I'll tell you, it lit up beautifully. And then you add the N2 bar rolling to that. And mm -hmm. Ooh, now the Prelite taste, I got a little bit of like a kind of a cocoa-y essence yep. or something, a little chocolatey thing. You get a lot of notes. So I, I'm a little ahead of you here, as you can oh, see yeah, right okay. there, just uh, probably about six minutes ahead of you. And I'm getting the same thing. The first notes that I got were a lot of caramel, cocoa, a little bit of espresso. Mm -hmm. right, that's good. Now the draw is perfect. Absolutely perfect. So Rocky, now this is a five by 50. How come you did a five by 50? You almost always do five and a half. No, this is actually uh, this is a torpedo. I think it's a six by. No, he's doing the Robusto. Oh, you're doing the Robusto. Okay, so that so is. You got the torpedo? I got the torpedo. It's right. hard to see in the little little picture. Okay, okay yeah, yeah. cool. I have the torpedo. Well, that's the one that got the uh, nine. Uh, the, uh, yes, so that's a true Robusto, right? That's a five by 50, or you can do five and a half by 52. Typically, the Robustos are there. Uh, I like the 5x50 only because of the time factor, right? Sometimes you really don't have a lot of time to enjoy a cigar, and we don't have a lot of time. The Robusto is perfect. Plus, I think the Robustos and the Coronas deliver a lot more richer flavor. Having a narrow ring gauge, you taste a lot more of the wrapper. Uh, you get a lot more flavor. There's less air through the tobacco, just like a 6x60 would have so much, you know, mass volume of air through the tobacco. So you're not going to get the actual flavor of the tobacco, because if you take the ratio of air to tobacco that's mixed in the flavor profile, you're gonna get a lot more from a Corona or a Robusto, or a lot of people like Lanceros. Sometimes yeah. Lanceros burn a little hot, as far as I'm concerned, but um, I think the Robusto is great. Yeah, it's, I'm getting a lot of spice up front here. It's very spicy, very peppery. There are some white pepper notes here, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, with a lot of our cigars out of Nicaragua, you know, the way they're bunched, when you actually bunch the cigar, a leaf, right. is, a leaf is kind of shaped this way, right? Most mm -hmm. people don't realize that all the nutrients go to the very point of the leaf. So when really? you actually bunch it in a tubular fashion, a coating fashion, and you take that tobacco, so you're actually tasting the point at the mm -hmm. beginning when you first start up. And so you get a lot more pepper usually in the first two, three minutes, and then it'll kind of ease back down and you'll get more of that caramel, coffee, espresso, uh -huh. uh, dark chocolate note. I think you were quoted as saying this is a decade on steroids or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. It tastes like the decade on steroids. With uh, decade like the decade too. The cigars. Anyway. So it's smoking, it's smoking really beautifully. Um, fortunately, the wind isn't affecting it in here. And it's burning really nicely so far. It's got a good, sh good uh, burn to it. And yeah, now it's starting. Or it's starting to round out already, and I'm getting a little bit of that sweetness coming through now. So the pepper kind of fades slowly, and yep. you get more dark chocolate, you know, caramel taste. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. Now, obviously, if you retro the cigar, you know, yeah. you're going to get a lot more flavor through your nose than you're just straight out through the palate in your mouth, right? Mm -hmm. Because your mouth only has so many senses of flavor capability. Sure. Your nose has many, many more. That's why the old adage, you know, when you were young and your mm -hmm. mom or grandmother gave you medicine, they always closed your nose as a kid just so you could drink it, <laughs> so you could taste it. And you should try that. If you ever try you know, a shot of vodka, tequila, or whiskey, mm -hmm. if you close your nose, you can barely tell the difference because your nose has so many more sensory profiles that it can actually taste. And so, you know, when you actually roll that smoke slowly out of your nose, you're gonna get a, just a much broader variety of taste profiles and sensations than you would just rolling the smoke simply out of your mouth only. Well, I'm gonna give it a shot. Do, do you, do you, um, do you just like, like retro hail normally, like, or do you like wait for a certain part of the no. cigar to get to, or you just, it's just. I mean, I pretty much retro hail almost every puff, if not every Really? Puff. Yeah. Just because you just get so much more flavor, right? Just so much more Ooh. flavor. I know we've been trying to get Nimish yeah, over here to do it for <laughs> years, and he can't seem to do it. I can't seem to do it, Gary. Can you do it, Gary? No, it actually was very smooth. I, I, I expected it to be peppery, but it wasn't. Yeah, I mean, the first few times you're going to try it, you might get a little bit of a tingling slash, you know, peppery kind of, and you might tear up, but then you get used to it after a while, and then you just see that. That's why when you serve wine, you have special glasses for it, because right. most of the aroma flavor is in the bouquet through your nose, and that's mm -hmm. why it's so important. Uh, so, yes, try that for you connoisseurs out there who really want to get to the next level of appreciating every leaf and every seed and every cigar, you retro and you'll get a much complex taste profile. Right, wow, that's cool. Um, hey, let's, while we're smoking this, and um, if you just joined us, we're smoking the Rocky Patel 15th anniversary Robusto. This is, Rocky's got the Torpedo. Nimish, which one are you smoking? I'm actually smoking the Nimi D. And then he okay. <laughs> you, won't, you won't let us move the 15s. They sell too fast here. So. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's what I wanted. To, actually, that's kind of a good segue because I want to talk about some of the newer stuff, Rocky, that you've come out with. Lately. Uh, I'm going to uh, pour myself a little. Gotcha. I'm going to get some little Lafroy while you're at it since you said we should enjoy a beverage. Yeah, and, yeah, go uh, for it. It is mid afternoon here and there's nothing else to do, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Oh, to be in Florida. Uh, I work out into the day, so. <laughs> Cheers. Salute. I um, I got coffee now, but I'm going to. Um, so yeah, this I'm is give a, this a, uh, twenty oh, four to try uh, when we get to like the midsection. So for those of um, those people who are watching who who may not be, you know, that familiar with a lot of stuff that's come out in the last few months from you, uh, I'm going to just go down a list of uh, cigars, and you can just. Off the top of your head, either one of you can go. Uh, let's start with the number six, which I smoked and I thought was very impressive. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Rocky number six. So the number six, you know, the reason we came out, first of all, often asked question is why is it called number six? Well, simply like we, ran out, <laughs> we ran out of names, right? It is so hard. <laughs> there's so many A's, limited reserve, there's vintage. There's, we just simply ran out of names. And the blend that we initially chose when we made the blends, I think it was like 60 or 70 different blends, was blend number six. So we called it number six. And it's very unique because it's the first time in our lineup that we've used an actual wrapper from Honduras. And so it's, uh, it's, it's grown in the Hamastron Valley. Yep. Um, most of the filler is from the Hamastron Valley in Honduras. It's almost a puro besides the binder. And mm -hmm. that cigar has that hint of sweetness that you get from the Hamastron tobacco, which I That's love. That's why I like Honduran cigars, right? Yeah. Because it's yeah. got all that sweetness to it. And so the number six is medium bodied in its flavor profile. Mm -hmm. I think it's got a lot of sweetness. It really reminds me of those AJ's Habanos, the Cubans from like 20, 25 years ago. Mm. Or, you know, typically I've only been to Cuba once, so I don't know a whole lot, but I, I happened to go to Pino Del Rio and, and, and visit right. some farmers there. And they had their little stash where they could actually take the tobacco, work it, age the tobacco, and, and make the cigar unlike the cigars that are in production in the factories. And you had that sweetness. 
And that's what I find in that number six that makes it quite unique. Well, speaking of sweetness, this thing just opened up and it's fantastic. It's all of a sudden the pepper, spice, all that went away. And it's now like a very well-rounded, sweet, yep. just wow. Just, it's, and, and I'm only about an inch in. It's just really great. Tell us about the uh, ALR. So the ALR has been one of our kind of newer pet projects and it's the direction in which uh, we're going in Nicaragua. Uh, you know, we made a decision a couple of years ago to build a special humidor that could accommodate aging a million and a half cigars. And our goal was, you know, we've been stockpiling and growing so much tobacco. Uh, you know, we have farms in Esteli, we have farms in Condega, we just bought another farm in Esteli. And so we've been getting all this filler and wrapper that we're buying for years and collecting. And the goal was to start making proprietary blends with a lot of aged tobaccos and then being able to take those cigars and put them away for 18 months, put them away for two years. And so we did that. The first launch was the age limited and rare project where we actually took some aged tobaccos, made this great blend, and then put the cigars away for two years. Only made a thousand boxes of each size. We released it at the trade show last year. Two and once they're gone, or two years ago? It's been that long? The original. The original, yeah. But the last batch, uh, number two, was released at trade show last year. And they're so good. I mean, they were so good. And uh, I think the demand has been great for them. Yeah, I liked it a lot, too. At least that cigar once a year at the trade show. And then, uh, you know, the next project now that we have, similarly, you know, taking that aging concept, we're going to release this being our 25th year now in the cigar business. I can't believe I've been in it 25 years <laughs> yesterday. So we're releasing, <laughs> we're releasing a brand called Quarter Century. And again, oh, okay. this is a cigar that's been sitting in the humidor for a long time, mm -hmm. a lot of age. Uh, it's a very different blend profile than anything we've ever made before. So we're excited about that. I don't know if we're going to have a trade show this year, but it, uh, yeah. we're looking to release it around July. So oh, that's okay. something else that we're working on that's quite new and different. So instead of the 25th anniversary, it's going to be the quarter century. It's a little Correct. different. Correct. Right. I like that. <laughs> then we have another one that I liked a lot, uh, which was the LB1. Correct. So Namish, you want to talk about the LB1? I'll talk about the private label. You talk about it. All right, all right. So the LB1, again, is a Habano wrapper from Ecuador. It's got fillers from Esteli and Condega in it. And I would say that's just over a medium plus. Uh, you know, that cigar has got a lot of earthiness to it. Um, it's got some lingering pepper to it. Uh, it's balanced. It's well-rounded. It's complex. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's also another release that... Uh, was from the trade show last year in July. Yeah, I like that one a lot. And then one I just, I was just talking about it before we went on, uh, which is the San Andreas, which, and I love, anyone who watches this program knows I love Mexican San Andreas tobacco, especially the Maduro. Tell us a little yeah, bit about yeah. that blend. So that's the vintage 2000. No, oh, about the one that we do for that. Oh, the, the private label you're doing, image you want to talk about? So that, that wrapper is actually from the Andreas Valley, the Torrance make that wrapper, and Rocky was able to get some of that wrapper. And then it has the fillers are all from farms in uh, our farms in Esteli, Condega, and also Jalapa. And the binder is also Costa Rican, if I'm not mistaken. Is it Costa Rican or I'm not positive, if I forget now if it's Costa Rican or Mexican, the binder. Mm -hmm. And it's got a rich, it's a medium plus cigar, it's got a ton of flavor, complexity, it's got a spice in it, the sweetness to it. All right. Um... I believe it or not, Gary, I don't think you were part of that, but Jim, it took us almost a year to refine that cigar. Two or three trips to Nicaragua to finally get the finished product. So, and that's a, that's a San Andreas Maduro on there, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, I, 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 I had a sample, but um, I really want to smoke another one. I thought it was, it had a very interesting taste to it. It was something of, of kind of like, I got kind of like a, a fruity note out of it, something like that. So you get you get a lot of that from the Costa Rican tobacco. So I've always said it's interesting you picked up on that because mm. Costa Rican tobacco, I always say, has nuts of uh, – it, it tastes very nutty. It, it's got like hints of orange peel, uh, hints yeah. of like that, that, you know, lemon grind. You know, it's got a lot of fruity notes to it. It's got a lot of 
almond, cashew, kind of pistachio, all that nuttiness to it. And, you know, for most people, uh, I don't know if they really understand what a Maduro is, right? That that word is often used in, in cigars, especially yeah. when you're expressing the wrapper. Well, mm -hmm. Maduro is simply the highest priming on the tobacco plant. When you get up to the seventh day priming, which is when you're at the top of the tobacco plant, most people identify that as Lijero. It's the heaviest tobacco, sure. it's the thickest tobacco, delivers the most flavor, and it's usually the richest tobacco. But in order to get the Maduro, Maduro really in Latin and in Spanish is color. It's that dark color that you mm -hmm. get, that rich, dark chocolate color. Well, that, that color comes in when you actually ferment the tobacco. Because that tobacco is holding so much fertilizer, nitrogen, boron, potassium, magnesium, it takes three to four years to bleed that out. And when you ferment the tobacco and you put it in the pallones and you rotate it every 10 days, top to bottom, bottom top, inside out, outside in, when the temperature gets to about 135 degrees Fahrenheit, this right. process goes on for two, three, four years. Well, when that happens, the sugars crystallize and they come to the top and that's how you get that dark brown color. And that's what mm -hmm. really Maduro is, and that's the true characteristic of a Maduro wrapper or a Maduro cigar. That's interesting. Let me just tell you one other thing about that. Cigar. Uh, you can, uh, speak up a little more or something. You're a little weak. Let me tell you know, about that cigar. When we were working on that project, I didn't tell Rocky we were actually going to have Sam and Andreas leaf, and he was ready to strangle because he doesn't give that leaf up for private labels. But he was able to procure a lot more tobacco from Toronto, so we were able to make that cigar. So you guys are actually the only people I have a private label with that San Andreas. Because for the price that that cigar is sold for by a famous smoke shop, uh, that's the Rocky Patel San Andreas, that's a great mm -hmm. value because that wrapper is one of the most expensive wrappers that are in the marketplace. Uh, between Broadleaf, San Andreas, and Connecticut, Connecticut grown in Connecticut River Valley, not any yeah. other Connecticut, is some of the most expensive wrappers in the world. And I got to tell you, uh, because we don't have it on screen here, but that that wrapper on that San Andreas is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it's like, it's flawless. It's, it's, yeah. it's got a beautiful sheen to it, a beautiful feel to it, uh, texture, you know, it's just really nice. And speaking of really nice, um, um, <laughs> I got a really nice session here. And this cigar has really rounded out. I mean, right now I'm getting kind of like a, a mix of, say, nuts and sweet tobacco, maybe like some sweet spice, a little bit of that cocoa in there. And it, it's, it's really, it's really good. I'm really glad we picked the cigar. So, uh, wow. How, how's that torpedo doing? It's doing great. I'm loving it. It's, uh, you know, we have so many different blends. I don't get to smoke them often enough, and this is one of them, but uh, yeah. I'm really enjoying the cigar. It's got like every puff is sweet, which I love, you know? Yeah, I and I'm drinking a little Lafroy with it, which has got a lot of peat to it, so it balances mm -hmm. well with Ooh. this cigar that's got a lot of character. I was actually going to... Uh, Bring down my bottle of the Macallan uh, to have with this. Would you recommend that uh, too? Absolutely. Any good scotch, big powerful red wine, a good cab, Brunello, Super Tuscan, all that, even a good bourbon, mm -hmm. goes well with this cigar. Let me ask you a question because you do make a lot of box press cigars. Uh, do you, how do you decide which are going to be box press? Like, what, you know, do you actually make that decision ahead of time and say, I'm, this is going to be box press if, or it has to be or? I mean, how do you how do you come so to it's, that? It's interesting. Well, when you make a blend, we try the blend round and also in box press. And believe it or not, when you take the same exact blend and make a cigar in a Toro size, which is round and mm -hmm. box press, you get two different distinct flavor profiles. Mm. There is, you know, the combination of having less air in a box press cigar uh, with the tobacco versus mm -hmm. a round cigar, which draws a little more air through it, it totally changes. And sometimes the round cigars are better, and sometimes the box press cigars are better. And it's an individual yeah. thing. Oh, and so what okay. okay. What yeah. I've noticed is when you take a blend, and the blend is from a mild to medium body profile, they taste right. better in a round cigar. When you huh. take a blend that is from medium to medium to full, they seem to taste better in a box press cigar. It's almost that the box press cigar takes out the rough edges. So you don't huh. get the rough edges on a fuller bodied cigar and it comp complexes and rounds out the cigar. And you really don't need that for a mild to medium bodied cigar because typically those cigars don't hit those high notes or those edges. It's like 
like in music or in mm -hmm. speakers, you know, when you hit those really high notes, yeah. it balances that out. So you don't get those high treble notes. It, it kind of just balances out the cigar. And that's the best way I can describe it. That's really interesting. I don't think anybody knows that. That's really great. So well, you've seen some of your high notes for the people. Right? Oh, I can't say. <laughs> if I sang, people would leave right away. I could so, do a little Sinatra, or I could do a little <laughs> bit of, uh, I don't know. Uh, you do some Whitney Houston. No, 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 I can't do that. Mark was a no. baritone, I think. Larry, uh, I could or do Or like Joe Williams, uh, I think. Uh, what's his name? Armstrong. Uh, <laughs> Louis Armstrong. Armstrong. You don't know who Joe Williams is? So I'm going to say you die. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Gary can sing. Oh, Gary can sing. Yeah. He can play well, the guitar. Well, We've actually allegedly, live on stage, so I'm a bad drummer. So I'm a bad wedding drummer, right? I, when I have a couple cocktails, I'll get on. The, I'll get on stage, and we've actually performed in a band together. You we and did I at, at the Jonathan's ago. wedding. That was yes, that was why. You know wedding. that um, I spoke to um, I spoke to uh, Marvin uh, last year. So you know he 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 always brings that up. He he says that was like one of the best nights of his life when we got up there and we started playing music and uh, yeah, it was an improv band. It was, it was fun. Uh, Marvin, uh, yeah. Eric Espinoza was uh, on vocals, <laughs> right. and then uh, a few other people. And uh, we we started playing one song. We ended up playing four or five. I know it was great. Uh, let me ask you another question. Um, I, obviously, you know you've been around a long time. You've made a lot of cigars. Is there one cigar that you've made that you wish more more cigar smokers knew about, or you know you want to bring to their attention? I think I would have to say Tabacusa. I think Tabacusa is one of our sleeping gems. Actually, two. Tabacusa and another one called La Unica. Tabacusa is more widely distributed. Uh, that right. happens to be the name of our factory in Esteli, Nicaragua. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is one of the more complex, rich, rounded cigars. Uh, you know, um, I think that one's a little hidden gem. And then I think the La Unica was a winner of the Honduran Cigar Festival. Uh, this was the wow. one and only cigar festival they had about a decade ago on Honduras. And each factory had to submit a blend. And then the consumer chose the best blend and it happened to be that blend. And it sold in a hundred count box. It's got a green label on it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's medium bodied in flavor. It's got a ton of sweetness. Cause again, it's got a lot of the Hamastron tobacco in it. And that cigar is a little gem. Uh, and, and look for it. It's called La Unica, and I think it's a it's it's a special find. Wow. Okay. And the Tabacusa. Uh, here's what Tabacusa. I have yeah, the Tabacusa looks kind of like this. There you go. That's the Tabacusa. It's very White good. Box, blue and label, so, uh, medium to full bodied and, and, and taste profile. So where is where is a mill car right now? So a mill car is actually in Nicaragua. You know, we bought these new farms. He's busy growing tobacco in the new farms, kind of monitoring that. Uh, presently, he's at home because uh, all the factories are closed. They're on Easter break. Uh, this is something the factories are normally closed for Easter break. We did oh, okay. shut down our factories last Friday. We don't know when we're going to open them back up. Uh, again, this is up to the government, you know, this is something that we monitor on a daily basis with the virus, uh, how bad it is. Uh, we've mm -hmm. implemented all the procedures for social distancing in the factory. Obviously, we've also implemented uh, some very clean standards for everybody, everything from the restrooms to using gloves to the way they're going to wow. make cigars moving. Life has changed down there now. So, uh, you know, this is all in the works now we're actually retrofitting the factories in a manner to keep everybody very safe that's the that's the most important thing that matters to us right now so once we can implement all these procedures and have these safeguards in place then we will consider uh, reopening the factories if and when uh things settle down and the government thinks that uh it's all right to uh, open the factories so you know we're, we're right now uh working on procuring gloves uh, you know, procuring all the things to protect our workers, both in Honduras and Nicaragua. I think it's just unbelievable how this thing is spread to like, what, like 183 countries I, now? I, I hope we never see anything in our lifetime again. I mean, this is, this is something that uh, is so unique in the world. So you, you see this in movies. Nobody ever thinks this is going to happen in real life. And, yeah. you know, it's just, it's just insane and it's scary at the same time. Um, it's a wake-up call. Um, you know, 
there's always you have to there's something good that will come out of this and i think as individuals all of us have has really uh had the opportunity to do some soul searching as human beings to see what we want out of life where we want to go uh, what's important and i think uh this will help us all into really uh, becoming better human beings and, and, and appreciating the things that matter in life that are important to us. And yeah, I, so I hope so. hopefully I hope right. we all we all move forward uh, as a society together. And I think the earth has also spoken to us and said, time out. I mean, you look at, I, I just came back from India and I see videos all the time. For the first time, they're, they're seeing dolphins uh, on the shores of really? wow. Hawaii. Uh, you know, there's no pollution. Uh, you know, the, the sunsets are amazing. Uh, there's yeah. so many cities that were so polluted. I mean, I talked to friends in Los Angeles. They, they've never, this is the first time they've never seen smog. Uh, you know, the, the moon last night was amazing. The stars, yeah, it was the pink moon. The pink yeah, moon. pink moon. The stars are glowing. Uh, so, you know, we need to rethink uh, how we live and how we move forward as a planet. Yeah, my son lives in Los Angeles and he's been a prisoner in his apartment. And uh, he's running out of toilet paper. And <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I, I, I poured myself some of this um, off cheers. 20 port, so I'm going to try it with your cigar. I have a feeling it's going to be a good mix. I hope it's not too much sweetness. Hold on. Ooh. Okay, let's see. Yeah, it opens it up nice. Ah, uh, port. I like port with a cigar. Do you, do you, have, do you have, ever have port with a cigar, Rocky? I do. I, I you know, I have tried port. I've tried, you know, the only it. thing I don't enjoy, I mean, I, I've tried whiskeys, cognacs. Uh, yeah. I'm not a huge bourbon fan. I lean really? towards my scotches and wines. I find, I find bourbons a little too sweet for my taste profile. Right? Oh, okay. so I've never been a whiskey bourbon fan. Of course, I like Irish whiskeys. I like scotches. I like wines. Um, I do like ports. I like cognacs. Uh, so we had an Irish whiskey we featured on uh, the show a few few weeks ago. I think it was when we did the um, it was like for St. Patty's Day, and uh, I think it was the Alec Bradley cigar, the uh, Filthy Hooligan. And we had this uh, a whiskey. You might want to try it if maybe you've heard of it. Called Writer's Tears. Oh, I never tried it. Writer's Tears, you know, like yeah. And uh, boy, that was really good. I was, and, and I'm not a big fan of Irish whiskey, but this was really delicious. And I've kind of learned to, kind of learned to like bourbons a little bit more because so many of our customers uh, like, like bourbon, and um, yeah, but bourbon's bourbon really kind of a hot bourbon. thing. Yeah, but uh, so I'm kind of getting used to it. I, I mean, I'm kind of a vodka guy basically myself, and I always like, like port with a cigar too. And I thought the port might be too sweet, you know, it might be too much sweetness, you know, between the port I, and the cigar. But it's really actually a nice mix. When I was a vodka guy 20 years ago. I mean, every once in a while, I'll, I'll enjoy my vodka martini, but now I've, I, I prefer a gin martini over a vodka martini. And there's so many yeah. great gins on the market. I just feel that you get a lot more flavor uh, when you're drinking a, a gin martini. Yeah. Vodkas are so clean that there's not a whole lot of taste profile, right? Vodkas are a good drink to drink when you don't want to really taste the alcohol and you just want to. <laughs> Throw down a few drinks to catch a little buzz. Like that Tito's. That Tito's is clean, yeah, clean, just clean, clean, smooth. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, let me ask you a question. Um, well, first of all, this thing is going great, and it's it's still been consistent. You, you would you would you would call this a complex cigar? I guess. Yeah, I would say it's a very complex cigar. I would say it's medium to full. Mm -hmm. uh, it's rich. It's complex. It doesn't have those spikes of those harsh notes. Uh, no, it's just I, really, really nice. And yeah. just That's a lot of caramel, cocoa, coffee, espresso with some yeah. lingering. Yeah, a little bit of that coffee now too. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about, I know you how, how involved you are with the, uh, the FDA and cigar rights and all that stuff. Uh, what, what's, what's the latest uh, that you've been able to? So, uh, you know, what, what's clean. going on with the FDA right now is, um, you know, we, we have a couple lawsuits that are pending in the D.C. Circuit. Um, we just got done about a couple months ago getting a favorable ruling on the warning stickers. The FDA wanted our beautiful boxes that really showcase the heritage of the cigar, the heritage of the families, 
they, they showcase the vintages, the different yep. tobaccos, Little uh, the age of the tobaccos, much like great wine labels, right? They tell you the grape varietal, the seed mm -hmm. varietal, same yeah. with, they tell you how old the tobacco is, how old the grapes are. Uh, so, you know, that messaging is very, very important to a consumer who wants to choose between so many different cigars that are offered in the marketplace. So we want to showcase that on our beautiful boxes. Well, the FDA wanted us to have warning stickers that cover up 30 to 40 percent of the boxes. And basically the messaging on all the warning stickers are that cigars are harmful. Uh, they cause cancer. Uh, you know, they cause all these other issues. Well, the judge ruled in our favor. First and foremost, he said that uh, you are infringing on the freedom to, of speech and, you know, to have uh, these family owned companies that can no longer talk about their heritage, can no longer talk about the type of tobaccos they use, the vintages they use, uh, you know, that that's a prohibition uh, that makes no sense because um, there's no reason to have these warnings on. Uh, you haven't presented any evidence. The FDA had not presented any evidence to show why these boxes need warning stickers. But the most important part of the ruling was that the information that the FDA required made no sense because they felt that there was no scientific evidence that was presented by the FDA to show that cigars are harmful for you, that they have any um, effects that impact, significant impacts on your health, and therefore they struck the ruling and the, the court said that the premium cigar companies no longer need to have these warnings on, on the boxes. So that was an important victory. Wow. that's uh, so huge. This, huge. The second thing that's happened is that the FDA basically wanted any cigars that were made after February of 2007, any new products that were released on the market to go through a process that's called substantial equivalence. Now, let me break that down. What that means is that was a standard that they implied and, and, and they kind of wanted cigarette companies to follow because cigarette companies were manipulating the tobacco. They were mm -hmm. changing the levels of nicotine, tar, chemicals on the cigarettes to get more people addicted to cigarettes. So the FDA formulated the standard so that every cigarette had to be made according to a certain chemical composition. And that works for cigarettes, but it does not work for premium cigars because each cigar manufacturer wants to and intends to make the cigar different and unique than each other, even with our brands. Each brand sure. is made differently. The composition of the tobaccos is different. The taste profile is different. From roller to roller, buncher to buncher, the cigars is, are impossible to make to a certain standard. Being a handmade product, they're individually made. They're not made by machines. It's impossible to have each cigar made exactly the same. So these standards that were applied from cigarettes to cigars are basically arbitrary, capricious, and make no sense. What the FDA did was they didn't actually take the time to investigate and understand this cottage industry that we call premium cigars. It's an artisan mm -hmm. industry. They didn't really take the time and they slapped on standards that were applicable to cigarettes and tried to apply them on the one glove fits all system to all tobacco products. And it's archaic and it's ridiculous and it's far overreaching. And so we're hopeful that we can get a win in the courts with that regard, right? Because at the end of the day, it would wipe out 80% of the premium cigar industries from business. It would wipe out all the mom and pop retailers. There would be new new products allowed in the marketplace, which is something that we all pride ourselves on. And, and these standards uh, are, are so egregious uh, you know, I liken it to sending a plumber to fix the rocket on the space shuttle. That's <laughs> the level of education that the FDA has to understand our industry. So we're hopeful that we can, there's an oral argument on this in court on April 23rd. Uh, so we'll find out the results of that. The other thing that's happening is that we've been very, very active with the White House. And the White House, really? yes, actually has a lot of sympathy to protect the premium cigar industry. They understand that it's very different than all of the tobacco products. Remember, we make up 0.01% of all tobacco products. And being an artisan industry, the, the fact that there are no youth access issues, 
with creamy cigars. Kids are not smoking creamy cigars. They're not addictive. They're enjoyed by adults, luxury lifestyle product occasionally, just like you enjoy a fine glass of wine or a single malt scotch. So the White House actually set up a task force to understand the issues and go to the FDA, and we're looking for an exemption. Well, we actually met with the White House probably three or four different times, senior people uh, basically in the cabinet, and we're hopeful that we get some relief. And while all this was going on, of course, the virus hit. So everything is on the back burner right now, but we're hopeful that when all the stuff with the coronavirus goes away, this issue comes back to the forefront, is dealt with. So we're hoping we can get relief both on the litigation side and hopefully also from this administration that is compassionate and understand that this is a cottage industry that needs to be protected. I agree. I agree. That's really that's really interesting news. I had no idea that the White House was um, behind that. That's 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 very encouraging. Yes, it took a long time to actually crack into the White House to get I'm them sure. to understand. You know, because this is about three hundred different th three hundred thousand jobs in Honduras, Nicaragua, Dominican. Sure. It's about fifty thousand jobs in this country. It's about two thousand five hundred mom and pop retailers. It's about seventy to eighty different boutique manufacturers. So you know, this would. Uh, a company like mine, if we had to go through all the chemical and constituent testing, which is what the FDA wants, first of all, there's no machines out there to test these cigars. Each cigar right. is made differently. From box to box, cigar to cigar, the tests would be arbitrary. Uh, that there'd, there'd, there'd not be a result that makes any relevant sense. And to make us go through, it would cost me $60 million by the time I would go through all the different SKUs and go through the testing and apply. And the rele the information that the FDA would get is totally irrelevant. It's so arbitrary that it, it, it's not information that makes sense to have companies spend that much money. Uh, so those are the type of issues we're battling. For all of you that want to get involved, please join Cigar Rights of America. The website is cigarrights.org to get involved. We want to show that we want to protect our fundamental rights as citizens to be able to enjoy the fine things in life. I agree. Now I've just taken the band off because I'm down into that last last third and it's still amazingly consistent and delicious. And Rocky, so who would you suggest the cigar is for? What kind of type of cigar smoker? Well, I think uh, this cigar is for somebody who's an experienced smoker. Uh, okay. If you're a smoker that typically likes a mild or medium bodied cigar, I think if you have a great meal, like a great steak, some lamb chops, something a, a healthy, a, you know, just a, a, a nice solid dinner, uh, mm -hmm. this would be a great after dinner cigar. Uh, oh, you yeah, know, I definitely. think with a fine glass of scotch or with a big bold wine, I think mm -hmm. that, you know, this is something you want to smoke every once in a while. Uh, if, you, if you like milder or medium body cigar, something you want to graduate to, to enjoy. And if you're an experienced seasoned cigar smoker, you're going to enjoy this all the time. Yeah, and it's very well balanced too. And it's very creamy. The smoke yep. output is really dense. It's just really, it's, it's just, you know, I mean, you can see why the cigar got 92s and 93s. I mean, and I mean, I'm not big into the scoring. I know a lot of the customers put a lot of more faith in the, uh, the scoring, you know, you know, I guess it, it's it's obviously good for you guys. It, you know, it helps sales, uh, but you know, this is definitely a four star cigar, no doubt about it. Yeah, um, you're getting I down. Mean, the best thing you can do is, you know, uh, just try them all and and see okay. what really you enjoy because it's a subjective taste profile. It's you know, we all have different tastes that we prefer, but uh, you know, give it a shot, try it. I think you'll enjoy it very much. Yeah, it's really great. So we're gonna be. We're going to be signing off soon, so I just have a couple more questions. First of all, I want to know what you've been doing with yourself, and you know, have you been uh, cooking? I know you love to cook. You've been doing a lot of that. Cooking too much. <laughs> I've I'm been, sick of cooking. I've been, uh, besides working out, I've been cooking up a storm. You know, I really have. I mean, uh, it's hard to cook for yourself. You can't invite people over, so yeah, I've been true. cooking a lot. I've been bringing lunches in for the executive team, bringing lunch for these guys all the he time. Uh, it's delicious. You know, once in a while. Uh, I have some very close friends, a small group of people that have been three or four of us that know each other that have been very safe and uh, uh, we're healthy. And, you know, we cooked like last night, we made some Persian food. Uh, I've been experimenting Ooh. with new recipes, uh, trying new things, uh, cooking on the grill. I have this clay oven called the Tandoor. I've been cooking a lot in that. Uh, so, 
yeah, just cooking, fishing a little bit, going out on the boat a little bit. Uh, but uh, yeah, other than that, just kind of enjoying nature, going for walks. Yeah, uh, yeah it's nice. Uh, <laughs> trying new things. It, it's very different for me. I'm not used to the slowed down pace in life, usually packing, unpacking, ironing. Yeah, you're a traveling from airport <laughs> to airport, doing events. We've been doing a few virtual events over the phone, reaching out to consumers. Uh, you know, we're organizing and planning things for the next couple of years that we're going to do as a company, uh, okay. coming out with some fresh ideas. So it's given us time to just slow down and really go into that think tank process and uh, see about how we're going to push the envelope for the future with cool new products and uh, new yeah. things that are exciting for the industry. Why don't you tell them about right. Oh, so yes, by the way, you know, one of the yeah. most popular releases we had uh, several years ago was a brand called the Winter Collection. And oh, yeah. I remember. so much yeah. demand for that cigar that we're finally re-releasing that cigar this July. So look for the Winter Collection. That's going to be out this summer yeah, also. Yeah, I remember you had, like, it was all, like, all four seasons. 2009, Gary. Yeah, 2009, we released the autumn, the spring, the yeah. winter. We, we had that beautiful artwork on them. Wasn't that the ones with uh, the, the sketches yeah, or yeah. something? Well, it was just simple and cool, but uh, yeah. so we're re-releasing the winter, so we're excited about that also. All right, great. Well, Rocky, I, I want to thank you and Nimish for, for coming on and joining me today. This was a really good episode. We, I think we really learned a lot, not only about the 15th anniversary Robusto, but about what you, you guys are up to and, and how things are done. And, and I really appreciate that. So um, thanks again for joining me. And um, I just want to say that remember that Rocky Patel 15th anniversary cigars are available at famous-smoke.com. And for more, Cigar smoking advice and information, visit us at cigaradvisor.com, sign up for our email list, and you can also follow Cigar Advisor on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you like this cigar, please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell to be notified when a new Cigar Advisor video is uploaded. That's all for now. Rocky, Nimish, thanks again. Thank you See again. You and time. listen, you can follow us at Rocky Patel Cigars on Facebook yep. and Instagram. Instagram, and then my personal one is Rocky Patel Personal on Instagram. So come okay. join me. All right, All right, excellent. Thanks again, guys, yeah. and we'll see you next time, everybody, and happy smokes. <laughs> <laughs>